right, so welcome back. So in this part of the lecture, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what transpires uh, with, with COPD, right, in terms of some of the pathophysiology, right? So um, here's a, uh, an image here demonstrating some of the, the effects of cigarette smoking and why we see um, all these changes, right? So cigarette smoking leads to these inflammatory changes, um, an overexpression of macrophages and neutrophils, which release these proteases, um, which if we have chronic exposure to cigarette smoking, um, our processes for cleaning our lungs, our, our macrophages, our, our neutrophils, um, which contain these proteolytic enzymes, um, the clear debris out sometimes can be a little bit overactive and uh, they can kind of get ahead of the repair and remodeling processes, especially in alpha-1 antitrypsin. But anyone with repeated exposure, you're eventually going to overtax the system um, and, you know, will be too far ahead of, um, you know, removal and breakdown and cleaning of the lungs by these uh, leukocytes leading to breakdown of the airways. So, um, we also see fibroblastic proliferation, so we see fibrosis of the, sm of the small airways. Um, we also see um, alveolar uh, wall destruction, and then we see this mucus hypersecretion. Again, just think, you know, especially with smoking being a top cause, if you're repeatedly exposing your lungs to a particulate um, or a noxious gas, it's going to cause problems. We are able to tolerate a little bit of, you know, dust in the air and stuff like that, but repeated exposure is really where we start running into problems. Uh, the other thing, especially with, with COPD, is we see this collapse and compression of the uh, small airways, especially during expiration when the pressures are going to be the highest. Typically, our airways um, have the ability for the lung, for the airways to stay open during expiration. There's going to be you know, a, a greater pressure um, placed upon them, but because the, the airways are so flimsy, and we see a reduction in the flow out of the lungs because of these fibrosis, the breakdown of the airways become flimsier, they become weaker and filled occasionally with mucus. So in COPD, again, we see you know, increased airway compliance, right? So um, breaking this down here, again, we see you know, a breakdown and you know, destruction of the elastin molecules in the lungs. Again, remember the lungs, 30% elastin by body weight. When this happens, the lungs are a little bit easier um, to, you know, to inflate in a certain sense or be to be distended. Uh, this is not a positive adaptation. This is not a good thing, okay? Uh, you know, this leads to a hyperinflation of the lungs, and it's kind of twofold. Uh, one, we talked about how the you know the alveolar ducts get compressed during expiration because they lose some of the the structure um, to the airways; they get broken down, um, so air remains trapped in the alveoli. The other is due to the re re reduction in elastin or the breakdown in elastin, we have reduced elastic recoil uh, pressure in the lungs, meaning that. That opposing force, remember we talked about the lungs, if we draw you know, our head here, our lungs, right? And the chest wall. Chest wall wants to pull this way. Lungs want to pull this way towards the body. We'll draw a little you know, face. Okay? If we reduce the amount of elastin, okay, the effect of the outward pull of the chest is going to be a little bit greater. Remember, these things are in balance. What's that, what that will cause is the chest wall to expand, right? Because we've shifted that force coupling. Remember, at the end of expiration or at the FRC, the inward pull, okay, the inward pull of the lungs and the outward pull of the chest wall are at equilibrium. They're balanced, right? Which creates that whole negative pressure in the pleura. We don't need to go back over that. If we reduce the inward pull, that's going to shift the equilibrium point a little bit towards favoring the chest wall, favoring expansion, even at rest, right? At that equilibrium point, FRC, 
which is you know that equilibrium point at the end of a quiet expiration. That explains the changes that we see, or partially explains the changes we see um, in the lungs. We, we see this hyperinflation of the lungs, right? It's due to this lack of, there's this increased compliance and lack of elastin. The other is we hold on to more air. Again, FEV1, that forced excretory volume in one second decreases um, in patients with COPD, especially um, emphysema. If you hold on to more air, we increase residual volume. More air remains trapped in the lungs. The lungs stay hyperinflated. So not only is there a mechanical change to the, the properties, the structural properties of the lung, the elastil, the, the FRC, the balance, the force couples, there are also, we're, we're just holding on to more air. We're not able to effectively get air out of the lungs when we breathe out. We also see decreased surface area of the alveoli. Uh, so what we often see, again, in a, in a healthy alveolus, um, we've got these grapes, basically, a grape sac. We've got multiple bunches on one alveolar duct, which gives us an amazing potential, right? Because we have all these different membranes for gas exchange. You remember what that, you know, we showed in normal physiology. In an emphysmatic lung, we lose some of those alveolar walls. We lose walls, we lose surface area, we lose membranes. So while you know, we see one bigger you know, bleb of an alveolus, right, there's less walls, there's less you know, opportunity for gas change, there's less surface area leading to a VQ mismatch. Okay? So again, emphysema hallmarked by destruction of the alveolus, air trapping because of the changes in FRC, at the, the recoil forces at FRC. Again, we have a reduction in the inward pull because the, the lungs lose their elastin. We have also holding on to more air because of the air trapping due to this compression of the um, alveolar ducts and airways because there's breakdown of the cartilage, breakdown of the smooth muscle. Um, and the, you know, the airways are just poorly supported. Um, and because of that, we also see increased airflow resistance because, you know, during that compression, these airways get smaller. It's harder to move air out. Okay. And we often refer to patients with emphysema as a pink puffer for, for that reason. It's because of what it looks like on a, we look at the lungs. It's got a phase that's kind of fading out though, our term is fading out. So. Um, you know, this is again just a histology slide looking and get, you know, we lose the surface area. So again, while there is one bigger alveolus, right, it's huge, there, you know, in a normal healthy situation, we'd have, you know, a membrane here, we'd have a membrane here, we'd have an, or an alveolar wall there, an alveolar wall there, an alveolar wall there. We'd have much more opportunity. The more membrane walls we have, right? The more opportunities for gas exchange because we have a greater surface area. We lose surface area for diffusion. Even though the lungs are hyperinflated and they're bigger, right? It's, um, they're hyperinflated and we've lost, right? Number of alveoli or number of alveolar walls. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and, you know, quite often we see in these patients, um, this presentation from the classic Netter book, um, we often observe patients are using accessory muscles, and we'll go over kind of why that happens. Um, we often see them doing this purse slip breathing, and we'll go over like why they do that as well. That's to help get air out in a little bit slower manner. Um, and they typically have issues holding on the body weight, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well too. Now, alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, again, creates a type or, you know, a type of um, emphysmatic COPD, again, is a little bit different um, than, you know, classic emphysema because this is a genetic defect. So alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin is produced by the liver and it's designed to protect the lung. Basically, the way it breaks down is we have, again, those neutrophils, those macrophages that are released in response to infection or infiltration um, to kind of clean out all those irritants, noxious particles out of the distal airways. Um, alpha antitrypsin 1 helps prevent those proteases or proteolytic enzymes released by neutrophils and macrophages, helps protect the lung from being broken down by those enzymes, okay? Without enough alpha-1 antitrypsin or AAT, uh, we have degradation of the airways occurring much faster than repair and remodeling can occur in the lungs. Um, so what ends up happening is 
you know, if we repeatedly expose the lungs to cigarette smoke, these things are overactive and these proteases are going unopposed, you know, rapidly breaking down um, the lungs. Uh, what we often see in these patients too, we may see liver damage because um, this product is produced in the liver. The issue is just they can't get it into the bloodstream. So we see a buildup of AAT in the lungs leading to cirrhosis. Um, so they have a lung disease as well as a liver disease. Not a good situation. The hallmark sign is these patients develop a very aggressive um, COPD. So typically COPD happens, you know, much, much later in life. You know, it could be well beyond the fifth decade. Uh, this can occur in the fourth to the fifth decade. So 40 years old, I've had patients develop this in their 30s. Um, you know, they were healthy, you know, you know individuals. They smoked um, and then led to these, you know, this rapid emphysema. Um, so again, the symptoms usually typically, you know, observe, um, you know, chronic cough and dyspnea in, in age 30s, but if they don't have genetic testing, a cough and a little bit of shortness of breath, um, especially in someone who smokes, you know, not too out of, out of the, um, you know, not, it's a bit of a vague symptom that could be, a, you know, a lot of things. So people often, you know, go uh, diagnosed with asthma or just some sort of non-genetic emphysema, not realizing, no, you don't just have emphysema, you have alpha-1 um, antitrypsin deficiency. And again, they'll develop the same um, pattern on a PFT, this obstructive defect, significant reduction in the FEV1, but it's due to a much different, much more aggressive pathophysiological manifestation. Um, interesting enough, it's estimated about 13% of patients with emphysema actually have alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, it's something that we're trying to get a little bit more uh, ahead of. There's better testing now for it in kids. Uh, we're more aware of it. It's actually one of the leading causes of liver disease um, or is the leading cause of, or genetic cause of liver disease in children, uh, second only to uh, cystic fibrosis. Let me restate that actually. No, it's the second, it's the most common cause of um, genetic liver disease and is the uh, second uh, second leading genetic lung disease to CF. Not CF is not a, the leading cause of liver disease in kids. Sorry about that. Now, chronic bronchitis um, is a type of COPD. It's a little bit different in terms of manifestation uh, than emphysema. Again, patients with COPD typically have a bit of both. They have a bit of alveolar wall destruction and you know flimsy airways and they also have a little bit of chronic bronchitis which is submucosal gland hypertrophy so they, their mucus glands those goblet cells are a little bit more um you know thicker they produce they're hyperactive they produce a lot more mucus and then we see obstruction in the airways due to bronchiectasis we'll go over what that means in a little bit um and atelectasis or small airway collapse due to this mucus they just produce a lot of more thick mucus and their airways are just Thickened. Now, looking at a histological slide, it's kind of what we observe: this, the the base membranes, the the um, in, you know, the airways, the the airways are just much more thickened. This is an example here from the Netter book, just looking at um, kind of what we you know observe in a patient. They'll just always be coughing. Um, they won't. You know, a patient with a primary chronic bronchitis might not be as um, uh, Let's say anorexic or cachectic is a patient with emphysema. Um, when we typically refer to these guys as blue blue bloaters, just because of the amount of uh, mucus they produce. Again, a term that's kind of being phased out. And um, we'll stop the lecture here. And in the next um, slides, we'll go over some of the uh, body system impairments and functional limitations that we often observe in patients with COPD. Thank you.